Good afternoon, everyone. The Kobuko volcano eruption sent a massive ash plume across the southern part of South America. This has definitely had a major effect on all types of agriculture as well as aquaculture. Grazing animals have been affected. Fisheries have been affected. In Nepal, the massive earthquake will affect their food production this year. They just cannot even get seeds and fertilizer in, let alone food to sustain the people. And satellites picked up the earthquake. This will take Nepal from a sort of self-sustaining rice-growing nation into 100% necessity. The sheer awesome raw power from the Kobuko volcano eruption sending massive ash plume across visible from satellites. Here's what it looked like from the 22nd to the 23rd. You can see how the plume expanded and then moved eastward. There were actually secondary and tertiary eruptions that also added to the total of the ash that was in the atmosphere. When we get 10 hours later than that, look how the volcanic plume dissipating has covered such a large area. That circle there is 100 miles across. Can you imagine the amount of ash in the air and size of this? Some animations going forward as to which airports were affected. It covered part of South America, at least 25% of. And these were the areas that had advisories as well as airport shutdowns. If you jump over to spaceweather.com, they have a great looping animation to go through the sulfur dioxide from April 24th. Look how it moves. April 25th. Oh, it's all the way across the Atlantic Ocean already. To the 26th. Ooh, it's already past the southern tip of Africa. Now this was sulfur dioxide concentrations, but you can only imagine that there's microparticulate in the air as well that's traveling right along with that. So instead of just thinking of gases, also think of particulate solids traveling across the ocean as well. I wanted to focus on the fallout because the fallout is what's really affecting agriculture right now. These grazing animals no longer have any grasses or plants to graze on, so the farmers are now going to have to try to import and find food for these animals. I didn't realize what such a huge milk producer Chile really is. Take a look at the dust cloud here popping up from all the, the volcanic ash from the rancheros hurting these animals. It's something you really wouldn't think about in a large plume of ash falling back to the ground. Aquaculture, fish farms, all of this ash ended up in the water suffocating the fish. Here's a quick look. They lost about 25 million fish out of the 300 million, about 8% of the total production. Again, I was unaware of what large fisheries industry they have down there. Mainly salmon. So... There's going to be a huge push on salmon prices. Look for at least a 20 to 25 percent increase in salmon prices over the next month to six weeks just from this single event alone. That's a lot of dead fish. That's a lot of lost money as well. And that's a lot of lost supply that goes into our food chain. And if we are looking for cycles, as you would expect in a new solar minimum, you don't have to have a crystal ball. What you need is a history book and the internet, and you can find out exactly what happened going back to the 1800s, the 1600s. Take it as far back as the Tang Dynasty 1,200 years ago in China, and all that information is available for you. No crystal ball needed. Study history. Cycles repeat. These volcanoes will start erupting or have some increased activity along the west coast of the United States in Washington, Oregon, and California. This is an incredible volcanic eruption strength comparison overlay from two ice flows. Volcanic and earthquake activity will increase and continue to strengthen during the solar minimum. We're talking about geologic events. Here's another one directly related, the eighth earthquake in Nepal. It's the largest one since 1934. Satellites, you might want to go to GOES and see the imagery that they've pulled off during the exact seconds of that earthquake, capturing the wave movement of our Earth. Now, having been in Nepal several times trekking, I know exactly what the conditions are like there. We walked through a lot of smaller villages in the lower Himalaya. Those areas were all dirt road, and the supply chain going in there was hit or miss anyway, even when things were good. But now the entire planting season is going to be missed because, you know, when you start taking a look at villages like this, people are just trying to stay alive and get their lives back together. They do not have time to plant food up there. In addition, 
How are they going to get an entire supply chain of seeds and fertilizer up into those villages? They can't even get food and water up to the people right now. There's not going to be a harvest this year. What's going to happen is Nepal is going to become 100% dependent on imports and donations from other countries. There will be no rice growing this year. If it is, it'll be so minimal, it'll probably come in around 75% less than normal. And when you actually look at the waves reverberating through the mountains, you can't help but think, how is nothing shaking off its base? There was no concrete and mortar into the smaller village areas. It was all just mud brick. That's why all those homes fell down. These are entire villages destroyed. Nobody's going to come together to plant those terraces this year. They're going to be more worried about trying to get shelter ready for the next winter coming up. You know, farming takes an enormous amount of effort, time, and energy, and devotion. That energy is going to be redirected to a different place for a while in this country. Entire hamlets wiped out. Places on hillsides, landslides. This was village before, now it's rubble. There's going to be nobody there to plant that. This is kind of what the homes look like. Again, they're just using slate rock put together or mud brick without any kind of concrete or any cement that holds it all together. It's usually just wet clay that dries. Slides on villages, these are very common. These are just the first photos coming off the helicopters in there to show the devastation and what really is happening out in the Gorkha region. You know, places further south of Kathmandu as well, around in Katan and a few other places I'd walked further south and out of Kathmandu, those places were steep and the same conditions. I'm sure they got shaken, the roads are busted up, landslides. And if we're looking for cyclical events, here we go, the volcanic explosivity index, but I'm over on the left side in the year. If we start taking a look from say circa 800 or so, we can go 800, the year 1000, 1200, 1400, 1600, 1800. It's a cycle. And again, cyclical patterns, all we have to do is take a look at the ice cores out of Greenland. They're cycling down. Each successive cycle is becoming a little bit cooler. Look how far down we are from the, the peak in the Minoan warm period. Last solar minimums that we have. They come on a pretty regular basis between 1200 and say 1450. There seem to be a lot more climatic upheaval. If this is one of those 800 year cycles, then we could predict it would come back at the year 2000 or starting. Are we going to do an 800 year repeat? Or are we going into something nice and soft like the modern minimum where the temperature dropped two degrees across the planet? And all this increased volcanic activity, there's 40 active erupting volcanoes today, 87 erupted all of last year. We are far ahead of the full eruption totals for last year. World average is 50 per year, 87 last year. We got 40 already right now erupting at the same time. Thanks for watching the video. Hope you got something out of it. If you like the information, please subscribe to my channel, Adapt2030.